Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for organizing this wonderful conference about the ocean. Because it is really about the ocean. I would like to start with this image, which I took exactly on the equator in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean at noon. It was a scientific expedition, five weeks long. It shows you the brightest blue that the ocean can offer in terms of color. That is what I do. I'm a documentary photographer. I show the reality. I show what is at stake. I show the beauty of our planet. But I also show impact. Impact of this conflict between man and nature. The ocean was long underestimated in terms of importance. It provides oxygen. 71% of our planet's surface is water, is the ocean. There's only one ocean. All oceans are connected. Besides oxygen, it absorbs carbon. It's the lung of our planet. It gives oxygen. It takes the carbon of the planet, of, of the atmosphere. The problem is, however, that we see that this is in decline, the capacity of taking this carbon. We see that the ocean is heating up. We see that it's, we have a problem of pollution. Plastic pollution, mainly. What I do is I am on the front line of climate change. I go not only on oceans with scientific expeditions, marine scientists, oceanographers, and so on, but also cryosphere, North, North Pole, South Pole, because we're all on the same boat. We're all on the same boat. We're, it's not that you know, climate change is happening far away. It's happening everywhere. And it's all related. We see it in terms of weather, weather patterns that are changing worldwide ocean currents that are changing, influencing these weather pa patterns. What I do with my image is building bridges between scientists and institutions, governments. I collaborate with multiple governments and also the industry. Solutions that are being provided, projects and so on. Positive stories of what is going on with the planet. I would like to start with this image. Remember, all images, none of them are photoshopped. This is what I saw. You see a small group of people, indigenous people in the Arctic. This is what is called a whiteout. A real whiteout is when you really don't see anything anymore. It's all white. No horizon, no depth. I learned a lot from indigenous people. In the Arctic, you have Sami, you have Inuit. Now, all over the world, there are indigenous people. In the Pacific, I do a lot of work. I will come to that. Indigenous people, they have this relationship with nature and a certain kind of understanding that we kind to lose. We, we don't remember that understanding. Half of the world's population is now living in cities. We are disconnecting to nature, to our environment. It is an artificial world out there. These people understand that when you take from nature, you also take a part of yourself because it's one system. It's it's in harmony, it's holistic. So I think part of the solution for a climate crisis might be also in indigenous knowledge. Now have a look at this photo. This is a thousand kilometers only from the geographical North Pole. This is in Svalbard. And have a very good look. This is February, this is July. Should be still white, it's not white anymore. Svalbard is heating up four to six times faster than anywhere else in the world. We have global warming ha happening everywhere, but especially the Arctic is really problematic, and more specific in Svalbard. A big consequence of that is that the permafrost is thawing. I just now come from COP29, where I gave two lectures as well, and I think that we should also really focus on methane, for example. Greenhouse gases, yes, they keep the heat in our atmosphere. This is a huge part of the problem. But we should talk more about the methane problem, the methane leaks and so on. Because you see what is happening. The soil cracks open. Methane bubbles and reservoirs are being released in the air. And the problem is that they're 82 times, sorry, 84 times more effective in the first 20 years. Effective in terms of keeping and capturing that heat in the atmosphere, causing global warming. 
you see the, the, the permafrost, you still see it here, and the active layer, which is the layer that thaws and freezes in winter and thaws in summer, that layer is getting bigger and bigger. So permafrost is getting deeper. Inherent to the cri climate crisis is biodiversity. Biodiversity is in decline. And that is not only for fauna, not only for animals, but also for plant species and also for food, crop seeds. So for 10 years already, I'm working on specific projects. And it all started here in the north of Europe in an old abandoned coal mine, 300 meters deep in that mine. The Nordic countries, Scandinavia and Iceland and Finland, they have put a container in that mine in 1984. And they said, well, we're losing crop seeds, varieties of genetical information of crops, 12,000 years of agricultural history on our planet. We're losing it. And when, when it's lost, it's lost forever. You can't, you know, uh, give it life again. It's lost, it's gone. So we're gonna store seeds from our Nordic countries in 20 boxes. And every five years, we will open one box. In every box, there is exactly the same variety of species. It's a viability project. They wanted to see, because we have really little knowledge on that, how we can preserve this biodiversity. You see here the dates are reversed. So boxes are to be opened uh, in 2056 on the 1st of uh, December, for example. So out of this experiment in 2008, the Norwegians, they built a facility for the world, the Global Seed Vault. And I'm showing you this project to show you the urgency of what is going on the importance of preserving, conserving, of strategy in terms of mitigation and adaptation towards the climate, we're, uh, the, the crisis we are facing. So this is a facility. This is what you see from the outside. It's a tunnel, 130 meters above sea level, and again, 130 meters inside the mountain, as you can see here, with three rooms, three storage facilities, vaults, and the purpose is to save this biodiversity of food crops worldwide. Copies of gene banks. And an example is the war in Syria, where the entire gene bank of Damascus was destroyed. And without this facility, a lot of the ancient, the, old, the oldest seeds of the moment where mankind started agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago, they were, they, they were lost forever, if not for this vault. Ironically, this is the tunnel. Already there was a leak. Luckily, no seeds were harmed, but in 2016, the permafrost around that tunnel is thawing so fast that already water infiltrated. This is how fast it goes. This is how we underestimate what is happening. So this is the most important door in our planet, the least accessible room, and perhaps also the most important one, with entire collections of seed diversity. It's a facility, so it remains to the deposit. The property is uh, still of the depositor. So let's go back outside. You see a photo of an animal, a seal, in its natural environment. And then you see in the reflection of the water a glacier tongue that is melting and retreating. This is happening all over the world. North Pole, South Pole, Greenland, tipping points. The problem is that this water it's, it's a dark surface. We need the ice not only for the animals, but also to absorb that heat, sorry, to reflect the heat. The water instead is absorbing the heat. It's the albedo effect it's called. Another problem is animals. This is narwhal, the Arctic tooth whale, tooth whale. It is very, very rare to spot a creature like this. Now, the, these animals have uh, evolved, evolved, sorry, evolved. They don't have a dorsal fin anymore, so they can hide for orca, the predator. But the ice is getting lost, so where should they hide? Same for polar bear, the symbol of the Arctic. It needs the ice to hunt. So let's go to the other side, Antarctica. This is a symbol of Antarctica. This is an emperor penguin. We see now that emperor penguins are migrating, also Adelis because of decline of sea ice. So I, follow, I followed a team of scientists five weeks long, capturing penguins, tagging penguins to see where would they go to, what is happening. Is the population in decline, like so many other species in the world? 
Also, we found bird flu, and we found it in one of the most remote corners of Antarctica. Alarming. The importance of ice coring. So glacial ice, they're keeping the deeper you dig in the glaze and take out ice in terms of cores, the further you can go and look into history. Because it is really air bubbles being trapped in between those snowflakes when they fell, fell down and formed the ice, layer after layer, forming glaciers. So we are now at 3,200 kilometers depth, Epica DC, and we can look back 800,000 times, uh, sorry, 800,000 years back in history. This is how we understand what is happening with climate change, because it is always cyclic, cyclic. But we see now that there is a huge uh, pace. It's happening very fast, and also biodiversity decline was never seen like that after the dinosaurs um, were getting extinct. This is a facility where they keep all these ice cores. So part of my work is, of course, documenting the beauty as well but also, again, what is happening. What you see here is an iceberg that flipped 90 degrees, and you see how surface water was cutting in the ice. It is a visual, uh, an infographic of climate change. Photos, they don't lie. They show you what is going on. A lot of coastal regions worldwide, also India, are threatened because of rising sea levels. This photo is in Lofoten in Norway. Lofoten is very dependent on fish, the stockfish, the dry fish. They hang it on racks in the air, and we see that the atmosphere is getting more humid. Everything is changing. This man is one of the few people who can smell when the fish is ready. It is a, uh, how do you say that? A, um, it's a product that has a label from the European Commission. So it, it's, they, these people are depending on it for, well, pre-Viking era, like 2,000 years. And it is changing. This is in the Philippines. Look at this. With the drone, I can really visualize how threatened these people really are. Indian Ocean, South Indian Ocean. So research ships, they don't go ashore for the biodiversity. These are the most pristine islands left on Earth. So a rat or a mice or mice, in, they can go off ships and destroy entire ecosystems. So instruments are brought on land by helicopter and we are really seeing plastic pollution there as well. That is a problem. We are all on the same boat. It's now everywhere in the world. These are the most pristine places. Look at this, a penguin colony. An orca type D. It's a very rare sighting. So scientific research is highly important. This is the Belgica. I'm from Belgium. I work with my government for the outreach and dissemination of the marine scientific work on the ship. Oceanographers, they really see what is happening. They measure it. They have data sheets. Policy level, they have policy strategies. And I try to bridge with image, tell their, tell their story as well. We took a deep net in the Mediterranean Ocean. And look what pops up. Do you see the confetti? Do you see all these dots of color? You see blue and orange. That's all microplastics. 100, 130 meters deep random point in the Mediterranean. It's even found now in the stomachs of polar bear, microplastics. Because macro becomes nano, it's plastic. It degrades, it gets smaller all the time. Scientific observation with floats, ocean observation is really very important. And luckily it gets attention on COP29, for example, so I'm happy for that. So let's go to the Pacific. It's really a region that I put extra focus on. The problem in the Pacific is that so many of these islands are low-lying. This is, for example, Marshall Islands. It's an atoll state. Highest point, two meters. Two meters, ladies and gentlemen. I think this must be 10 meters. These people are losing their land. Think about biodiversity. Losing their land. It means when the sea level rises, at a certain point, they're drowning. They have, they're becoming refugees. This is Ebai, the island of Ebai. Of course, it's a symbol in a way because I went to that specific island where it's the most densely populated place. Egypt, Egypt it's called. And you see the seawall on the left, but then financial means were gone. They can't complete it. Seawalls is 
more or less the only really resistance they can have, and it's very temporary, of course. That ocean was once a bridge to the neighbor. Now it becomes a threat for future generations. This is Kiribati. In Kiribati, they really don't have nothing, no financial means either to build seawalls. So they have bleached coral stones that divers are picking up from the bottom of the floor, from the seabed, to try to resist the water. Tuvalu, narrowest country in the world. This is a vote in the United Nations. It's a sovereign state, Tuvalu, like all the others that I just mentioned. They have all of these problems, and especially coastal erosion. Look, that's their country. This is their country. It looks like this. And the ocean, it washes away. It takes away pieces of land. Year after year, another centimeter is lost in the water. So mangroves, Temporary solution, mangrove plantations, keeping the soil together. Of course, when your soil is getting all salty, you have to import everything. Also water, first nation in the world that has to import, that has to import uh, now also water, drinking water. This is really what it is about for these people and for all of us everywhere in the world. Palau is a very positive example in the way, in the, to the extent that they started immediately realizing we have to protect our marine environments so or marine protected areas. Sustainable tourism, ab abolishment of um, uh, uh, sun cream. And also they came up with a pledge, the Palau pledge. You cannot enter this country without signing this pledge, promising that the only footprints that you will leave are those that will wash away. It's a great idea. So, the Arctic World Archive is another kind of archive also in the Arctic. It is also hidden in that mine. And it's trying to preserve heritage, things, everything that is getting lost, but that are human made. And I also do that for the Pacific Islanders. So I brought in all of these photo projects for the future, but also to symbolize the urgency. It is printed on microfilm. This is a deposit I did this year. So thank you very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. And it is really about awareness because it is a matter of time. So thank you very much.